Hello, Yoram Chazoni. Hello. It's good a, to see you. Good to see you too. It's a pleasure to see you. We were both in Rome just before the plague, right? Your, con your conference on uh, national conservatism was r just m a minute before the plague. We, we all got out of, out of Rome at the, on the, almost on the last flight. The last minute, yeah. Um, so I, I just introduced myself first. I'm Gadi Taub. Uh, I'm a columnist for Aretz. Uh, by training, I'm a historian. Uh, my PhD is from Rutgers in American history. And I'm a senior lecturer uh, at the Federman School of Public Policy. And my guest today, I am honored and pleased to have uh, Yoram Chazoni, president of the Herzl uh, Institute, chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation. And your recent book, The Virtue of Nationalism, was chosen to be conservative book of the year. And it's doing well. It's been translated to how many languages? Uh, it, uh, about a dozen languages. Oh. I mean, they're, they're not allowed yet. They're, they're in, in the process, about, about, about a dozen. So it's, you know, it's one of those books that having read it, you say, how come this wasn't written before? It's like there was a missing piece <laughs> in all our discussions because I, I teach, uh, I, I teach a political philosophy and I found myself nodding at the beginning of your book saying, when you, where you said, we're just not teaching this right. There's something missing in the way we are teaching about nations. So for, uh, suppose this is an introductory course, what would you say that is, is the, the main thing we're missing when we, we're teaching political philosophy? Well, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think, I, I think that the nation is one of the central concepts that's, that's missing. I mean, it, it's part of a broader problem, which is that in general, uh, the universities teach only the liberal school of thought in political theory, and they don't teach conservatives. Uh, so there are different kinds of conservatives, but one, one thing that, uh, one concept that definitely holds uh, together that you find in common with um, uh, old Anglo-American conservatives like uh, Fortescue and Koch and Selden and Hooker, connecting to uh, Burke, to Americans uh, uh, like uh, uh, Adams and Hamilton and, and going forward, uh, one central concept is, is the concept of the nation. And uh, in, in liberal political theory, there, there really is almost no, uh, no nation. They're individuals, and those individuals are free, and they're equal, and they have rights. Uh, and then by consent, they agree to have a state, a, a government over them, and but based on no, a society that's just a social contract. That is a contract, but, 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 like but a there's, not, contract. there's nothing other than consenting individuals. Now, in, uh, uh, when a conservative looks at the political world, um, he or she will see uh, you, that you, human beings are attached to one another uh, by loyalties, by powerful loyalties uh, to, to a community, to traditions, uh, and and the largest community is called the nation, uh, and government is you know something that you know if you're the Kurds you ha you have they've had a nation for for thousands of years. The question is will will they succeed in adding uh, an independent state to their nation? But there's no question that the Kurds are a nation. Uh, so that that is not discussed in political theory. It's as though the nation does not exist. And, and this, of course, uh, we see a reflection of this in, in uh, political discourse in, in, in the press. And I found myself, as I told you in our brief conversation before this uh, Zoom meeting, um, using your book to explain why uh, nationalism has made a comeback um, in response to a corona, or, or nationalism's comeback has been... Um, intensified by the corona. And the concept that, that, that I, I found myself using was the concept of mutual loyalty. Because what we could see in Europe very clearly is that the European Union, this diffused monster, is not like a federal government in the United States. And it was helpless in, in, in responding to the virus. And peoples clung instinctively to the, 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 the nation state, the national borders. And my argument, I, I, I'm guessing you would agree, but if not, you correct me, that nationalism, which had a 
the, the elites of the West have been attacking nationalism since the end of World War II, and we know why, because extreme nationalism has, been, has done, um, has wreaked havoc on, on Europe. But we forget that nationalism is also the most common basis for altruism, so that when you have a nation state, you can demand sacrifice from your citizens. Um, what's your view on, on, on how, how Europe is, uh, or the European Union is doing in the face of recent developments? Well, I, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, I, I think that our, our Italian friends woke up and discovered that they were alone. And uh, all, 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 all of the talk of, uh, uh, of a, a united Europe, of a federal Europe, uh, turned out to be uh, just so much uh, eyewash. The, the, there was nobody for a, a very long time, nobody in, uh, in, in Germany or in Brussels uh, was interested in, in uh, uh, sending doctors from, from around Europe to Italy to, to risk their lives. Uh, Americans are still a nation. America has all, all sorts of hardships and difficulties and the American nation is not, not, in, not in good shape in many ways. But Americans know that they are a nation. If a, 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 a nurse in Idaho feels that she, uh, that, that she can contribute in, in, in New York, she, she goes to, to New York. And it's not an altruistic thing. It's a, it's a patriotic thing, a nationalist thing, that uh, uh, Americans care for other Americans. Uh, and uh, that, 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 sh that, that wouldn't surprise us if we were properly educated in politics. Um. So here's the interesting thing, because since I, I teach about these things because I teach about Zionism and Zionism turned out to be now the paradigmatic nation states. And for yes, a long exactly. time, for a long time, the European elites, the elites of the West have been frowning at us as if we were a relic of some um, bygone age of national chauvinism that every enlightened person has already shed off. And then on the other side, and this is why it, it's interesting for me because my, my perspective is both American and Israel as in, in my professional life, is that people think of America as the other pole, as not a nation, as America being the pure social contract, the nation of immigrants where there is no nationalism was, when I studied in America, nationalism was almost a swear word. Well, look, as you said earlier, this is, uh, uh, this is the product of the trauma of the Second World War. Uh, I, I, I just read a speech that, uh, uh, that, that was being circulated on the internet by Cordell Hull, who was uh, uh, Franklin Ro Roosevelt's Secretary of State during uh, World War II. And in 19, uh, 1942, he, he gives a speech in which he says that it's, you know, it, it, it's obvious to uh, he says all would agree that nationalism is essential uh, so, so long as it's not extreme. It's essential for the well-being of, of, of every nation. And Hull is, um, when he says all would agree, he's, he's describing the consensus of uh, educated opinion uh, prior to the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, uh, up until that point, the idea that uh, that uh, that that America is not a nation would simply have been uh, insulting, but uh, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, Western elites have been traumatized. We've been living in the shadow of World War II for three generations now, and uh, because of the fact that uh, that that World War II was such a trauma, people say, "Well, look." What, what, a nation, what do nations and religions do? They give strong unity to people to uh, defend their own traditions, to stand up for their own laws and their own way of doing things. And that puts them in conflict with others. And we're not willing to be in conflict with others anymore because it's too dangerous. So the goal is to eliminate conflict by eliminating nations and eliminating religions. And the state has to be separated from religion. That's also uh, uh, a post-World War II, part of the post-World War II trauma is that Americans are not allowed to, to, to teach any religion in their schools. And they're not allowed to talk about the fact that they're a nation. 
So they, they've been kind of living in a liberal fantasy world in which uh, there are no religions and there are no nations. It's kind of uh, John Lennon comes to America, right? And then they claim that this has been America since its founding, but that's not America at its founding. It's, it's America post-World War II trauma. Got the, got yeah, my sound. Um, it's back. Yeah, Can you hear me now? Um, if you if you look back at at the founding of America, um, then you you still see two schools. And I, I'm guessing you would put Adams and Hamilton on one side, and then you have Jefferson saying something that would maybe turn into uh, what some liberals now try to call a constitutional patriotism. Because Jefferson would make the argument that people in America would be patriotic because the laws defend their freedom. Therefore, their patriotism is their personal freedom. Um, while um, Adams or, or, or Hamilton would probably have a, a view closer to, to yours. So is America more Jeffersonian or more Adamsian? Well, there's there's actually a a a, a large uh, research project that our, our our friend Dr. Ophir Haivri is doing about the uh, the Federalist Party, about mm -hmm. uh, uh, George Washington, uh, Adams, uh, Hamilton, John John Jay Marshall, and uh, and his argument is that the, the the Federalists are exactly the the what, what today we would call national conservatives. That they they were very much aware that uh, that Americans were a nation. They fought against uh, the tendency to want to divide America into tribes, and their goal was to establish uh, America as an independent national state on you know on on the model of uh, independent uh, Britain or, or or Holland two centuries earlier, which is ultimately the model of biblical Israel. And uh, those, those were people who understood that uh, Americans are bound by ties of mutual loyalty, that they, uh, that they share a religion, that they share a language, that they share the common law uh, of, uh, uh, of England a, a, as their law. And those things make them a people. Now, obviously, over the centuries, Americans have adopted others into, into their tradition. And every Every nation and every tribe can adopt others. There's a, a, a nation is not a race. Yeah. You, 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 can, you can adopt just the way a family can adopt children who are not born into the family. A nation can also adopt others who are not born into the nation. But none of this made anyone in America think that America was not a nation until, you know, until centuries later when it, uh, it, 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 it became not politically correct to be a nation anymore. Um. Would you pinpoint the 60s um, or, I, or before? I, I, think, I think the the turning point is is World War II. Uh, right after World War II, uh, you you have uh, the Everson decision in 1947. The Supreme Court decides for the first time that the uh, that uh, uh, schools in the United States are not allowed to teach, uh, even to give the students a, a choice between. Uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Judaism, because religion is no longer permissible in uh, in the schools. That 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 that's kind of the turning point. But I think you're right that uh, liberalism becomes hegemonic. It becomes dominant in a way that can't be turned back uh, only in the 1960s. And uh, in in this, I recommend Christopher Caldwell's uh, new book on on this subject. I think it's very convincing, and I think it's true that uh, really what happens is that in the 1960s, um, uh, liberalism replaces Christianity as the, uh, as the um, undercarriage, the, the fa foundation of uh, the, the American nation. And from, from then on, it becomes uh, a requirement that, you know, the most important constitutional requirement is that you impose individual equality and individual liberty without balancing that against any other American traditions. So, so it's, a, it, it, it's a really kind of a revolution that takes place in the 60s, but it's not the hippies who did the revolution, it's their parents. Um, 
it's interesting to, com to, to compare this with, with Israel because in the 60s, we were uh, at the end of the 60s, towards the end of the 60s came the Six Day War. It, we were um, a, a very tightly bound society, um, still fresh from its war of independence. Then came the immense victory of 1967, and it seemed that Israeli nationalism was at its height while the anti-Vietnam demonstrations were going on in America and while students in Paris were revolting against the system and, and, and all of that. So it, it seems almost inevitable that we would turn into the whipping boy of anti-nationalism worldwide. Well, it, look, it, it, I, 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 I think that it was, uh, that, that it became inevitable um, from the moment that, that, that Israel was, was founded because it, Israel was founded uh, to defend and protect and cultivate one nation, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. And uh, it says so explicitly in our Declaration of Independence many times, and uh, and it, it's in our laws, and it's that's the way that we govern. And uh, as you said earlier, uh, that's kind of the opposite model from the European model of eliminating the borders and eliminating the nations. Right? So instead of being proud of your past, the Europeans uh, produce currency that that eliminates the past and has no no past whatsoever. Uh, in the images that that, that, that are circulating, it, yeah, you're talking it, about the, the actual notes of the. I'm talking the, the, the actual the euro. euro. The actual euro, it doesn't have Shakespeare on it or or, or Dante or Goethe. It has no one. It has fake buildings that don't exist anywhere. They're invented. They're imaginary. And the the the, the Europeans are proud of the the people invented this. They're proud that that there's no connection of time and place of any kind on in, in the images that they that they use and so so this really is exactly the opposite of israel for us our future is where our past is and 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 for them the future is a revolution in which we erase the past those two things can't they can't coexist in the same uh, in the same philosophical system and it turns out that they can't coexist in the same political system so uh, I, ideologically we're completely opposed to one another and uh, and and what we've seen over the last decade is that uh, Israel has become uh, a model for uh, for the first time in in uh, in more than a generation, maybe two generations, uh, a model for Europeans and Americans who want to to take back their countries and to make them uh, independent national states again. Um, it, the relations between between Israel and and Europe. Um, and and the a lot of European money. We have to tell those who maybe don't know. Uh, I'll use a phrase by uh, Paulina Neuding, whom you know, uh, the, the Swedish sure. journalist, uh, our friend, who said that that Israel has become a Disneyland for NGOs, like all European <laughs> do-gooders with anything with with human rights in their title, come here and. Uh, 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 in, intervene in, in Israeli politics because in, in some way, if Europe is trying to escape the past, has it, would it be reasonable to say, do you think, that they have made us symbolize the past that they want to get away from somehow? And yes, so they, I, they, have a, they have a thing against our nation, not just I, against I think, nationalism. No, I, th I, I, think it, I think it's quite explicit the the, uh, the 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 constant comparisons between Israel and Nazi Germany they're they're not simply intended as an insult for for the Europeans you know I I mean it's it's true also in Israel and in America and other places but certainly for the Europeans um, the, uh, uh, to say that someone is a Nazi uh, or a fascist is to say that th they're primitive people who have rejected the enlightened view that we can overcome, that we must overcome nationality and religion in our politics, and and, and have a politics that's focused only on the uh, only on the uh, on on the freedom and equality of the individual. And so, whenever they meet someone who says, uh, 
look, my history is important to me. I'm fighting for the survival of my people. I want to uh, inherit the traditions of my forefathers and, and hand them down. Th th this, is, it, 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 this is sacrilege. And when someone says, look, you, you, I, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but you, you Israelis, you remind me of Nazis. They're not st simply calling us names. They're referring to this uh, uh, clash of, of paradigms, of fundamental worldviews. They they're, they're saying anyone who does not believe that the borders should be taken down is a primitive, is a, is a danger, a menace, and you Israelis are a menace. And you, you saw the, the, that, that poll that I, Israel is considered to be, by Europeans, to, to, to be the most dangerous, or one of the most dangerous countries on earth, right? Yeah. It, make, it makes us laugh, because for us, nationalism means we have borders and we have no interest in, 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 in conquering Cairo or, or Damascus or, or Baghdad, whereas the Europeans are, are, don't have borders. They don't have any idea wh wh where their, their worldview is supposed to stop. But, but we're the ones who are threatening the world. <laughs> yeah, we, we've probably manufactured the coronavirus too. I'm sure there will be a conspiracy theory in the Arab world at least, uh, blaming us for that, if not soon, in China soon, too. Um, soon enough. So let me ask you about about personal liberty, because um, part of m my view and, the, and, and what I've been trying to do as a teacher with students who, who come only with this liberal paradigm, as you, as you rightly point out, is to fight against the dichotomy that says there, is, there are individual liberties on the one hand and nationalism on the other, and the two are if not enemies, then opposing poles. Because your view of the nation is not supposed to negate personal liberty, is it? No, on, on, on the contrary. Uh, individual liberties are a national tradition uh, that de de develops over, over, I mean, we, we can talk about the connection of, of uh, the Tanakh, of, of the, the Bible to liberty also, but let's say that at least for 900 years, the, the the, the modern concept of individual liberties was developing uh, f first in England and then uh, and then later in America, also Holland, Scotland. 19, Let, let's nine, say, 900 years, the Magna Carta or? From, from before my mind, I mean, it, it, it's already very clear in, in uh, Glanville and in Bracton, and they, are, and they claim that it's a much older tradition. That's, that's in the 1100s. So, uh, the, the, the development of um, the concepts of limited government, uh, private property as the basis for, uh, for economic flourishing, uh, due process of law, uh, the rule of law and the king uh, deriving his powers from, from, from the laws, all of these concepts are uh, many, many, many centuries older than liberalism. And, uh, and they develop only, you know, they, they, they develop in England, they become an English tradition, and uh, that English tradition is bound up in, uh, in the idea of the, 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 the English nation as a free nation. Later, it, the, the, the Americans inherit it, and others copy it, the French copy it. All of us, uh, when, we, uh, when, when, when we look to see how to construct a, a a modern national state, all of us are influenced by the experience of the English national state, which is the only framework that ever de developed liber liberties, individual liberties of the kind that we're talking about. No uh, um, uh, imperial uh, state conquering many, many different nations ever succeeded in creating something like a, mod something like a democracy, modern democracy. Modern democracy, its source is in the national state. And so a person who believes in cultivating these traditions of liberty should be concerned about the foundations. The foundations are in, uh, in a people, in a nation that has the appropriate traditions to be able to make such liberties possible. Here's an example that I, I, uh, that I often use when I'm speaking on the subject, which is that uh, in, uh, liberal political theorists say that we're free by nature. Uh, and a conservative will say, you've obviously never raised children because if you raise children 
and you have them at the Shabbat table, you have a bunch of ch children sitting around of different ages, you'll see that they do not respect freedom of speech by nature. They have no interest in freedom of speech except their own. All they do is step on all the others and then, and then complain and fight and, and argue and accuse one another and get insulted. The training to be able to speak freely, to, 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 to not only to say what you believe, but to allow your brother, your sister, your friend, your enemy to say what they believe, that's not by nature. There's nothing natural about it at all. It's, it's, it's many, many centuries of training to in, inculcate something like that. And even in your own home, it takes, it takes a decade to teach people to do it. And even then, only with partial success. So we have to make the shift to a realistic paradigm where we understand that if we believe in freedom, then we need to understand what are the prerequisites of a free society. And those prerequisites require traditions of freedom. And liberals don't believe in traditions. So, but, but they do have these traditions. So this is the Edmund Burke um, support of the American Revolution, right? Because it's a tradition there, not because these, these values are, are natural or universal. But where does the tendency, so we, we understand where it comes in the Anglo-Saxon world, in, in England and in the United States, uh, but where does it come from in Israel? Well, I, part, of, part of my, uh, my project is uh, to, uh, to show the way in which the Anglo-American tradition comes out of the Jewish tradition. And uh, th 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 this is something that uh, um, I I've written about it some. I, I, there's an essay called What is Conservatism? There's a lot more to be said. But um, you can uh, take a thinker like Fortescue who wrote in praise of the laws of England, which, which appeared at the end of the 1400s. And uh, that, that's a text that is uh, through and th shot through and through with references to the Old Testament origins of, uh, uh, of the ideas that we've been uh, discussing. If you, uh, in, in fact, John of Salisbury, the Poly 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 Polycratus is the, uh, the, the, the original great book of, uh, uh, of English um, political theory from the 1100s. If you open it, you'll see that he has uh, near the beginning close to 40 pages of commentary on Deuteronomy, on the law of the king, on the biblical law of the king, the, the mosaic law of the king, to show how the laws of England come out of uh, the, those laws. Uh, um, let me suggest something um, more mundane. Uh, m m perhaps mundane is not, because Israeli society, you know, in, in, w when people say Israel is on the verge of fascism, my first response is, you can't make three Israelis stand in line to the bus. How are you going to have fascism in this <laughs> disorderly society? And, and, and it's not even that Israelis don't like rules. It's just that they all think of themselves as the exception. And... <laughs> and, and perhaps this, this, this also comes from, you know, the, the, the Talmudic tradition in which the good student is not the one who knows the right answer. He, he, the good student of, of the Talmud is the one who can explain the different points of view. Does this have something to do with the, with the tendency in, in, in this society? We, we, are, we are the only... Uh, to be, the best of my knowledge, the only culture of real controversy. Is, does that have to do with, with pluralism and, and liberty in, in Israel? I, I have no doubt at all. I, I mean, uh, the, the Talmud, as you say, the, ta the Talmud is, uh, is not a record of legal decisions. You know, like the Roman law is a record of legal decisions. The Talmud is a a record of legal argument, which which usually doesn't make any decision and 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 brings uh, the different opinions. But now I'll, I'll I'll take your your claim and I'll push it further. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Hebrew Bible is constructed. The, the Talmud is the spirit of the Talmud is an imitation of the Hebrew Bible, and the the the, the rabbis of the Talmud know this when 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 they read. Uh, Ishayahu, the prophet Isaiah, and they read Yechezkel, the prophet Ezekiel. They read these two great prophets, and they say, "Look, uh, they both visited the throne room, the throne of God, and one of them. And they saw the same thing. 
they saw the same God and the same angels, but one of them says that there's that the angels have four wings, and the other says that the angels have six wings. And the rabbis ask, what are we supposed to understand from this? How can you resolve the contradiction? And they say, well, look, the answer is that Isaiah is from the city and Ezekiel's from the country, and they have different perspectives, and you can't expect them to agree. <laughs> now, you can say that's a, a rabbinic joke, and it is, uh, but it's also true about the, the uh, about the the Tanakh. The Bible is a collection of many, many different perspectives, and this uh, uh, competition among different perspectives, which are all legitimate, uh, is something that is at the very, very uh, s source, the very root of Jewish tradition. And uh, in 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 the end, I think that that uh, the 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 West benefits. Uh, from these Jewish texts to a very great degree, but uh, but but Jews more so. <laughs> um, I, I want to end um, with going back to to a book you wrote long ago. I think it was the end of the nineties, um, the Jewish State, the struggle for Israel's soul, uh, two thousand. And, and I think I I saw you in a conference in in New York because I went to listen, and there was the whole. Elder statesman of of uh, of Israel's Israeli history, uh, Shlomo Avineri and, uh, and Anita Shapira and others, right. um, and 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 they they took issue with your book. What what do you make of it in in perspective? What is the is there still an argument? Would you say between the, their school and your school, the Israeli left, and the and and the view from the the national conservative view. Well, look, it, it's kind of the, it was a little bit strange to have Shapira and Avineri uh, taking the side side of the anti-nationalists because they're both nationalists. Yeah. They they are. They're both they're, they're both nationalists. It doesn't mean that they have to agree with me about everything. But uh, the 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 classical old. Uh, labor Zionism was a perfect, perfectly, perfectly good, solid uh, uh, Jew Jewish nationalism, and in some ways even conservative, but certainly a good, solid Jewish nationalism. And uh, at the moment that we had that conference in the year 2000, what was taking place was that uh, Avineri and Shapira were kind of, you know, among the very last of the old Zionists in the intellectual life in the state of Israel. And their students had already almost overwhelmingly adopted a liberal point of view. And that liberal point of view was, was exactly what we've been discussing. It's the same European or American liberalism, which says, do not talk to me about mixing religion and state. Do not talk to me about mix mixing nation and state because we, we don't believe in nations. There's individuals, and and there's the state, and anybody else is, is, is is not just wrong, but he's an incipient fascist. So uh, at that time in Israel, uh, this trend to reject uh, the public place of the Jewish people and of the Jewish religion was called post-Zionism. I don't know mm -hmm. if people even remember that word so well now, but it still exists. The post-Zionism. Uh, which is really just another name for liberalism. And uh, liberalism uh, continues to fight with Marxism for control uh, of Israel's universities and Israel's uh, intellectual culture. And uh, luckily the public doesn't, um, uh, the public is closer to, uh, to the old, old, old uh, Anita Shapira and, and uh, Shlomo Avineri Zionist view and still not really accepting the, 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 the view of the intellectuals that Israel needs to give up its Zionism and to become you know, a, a liberal state like, you know, and, and join the European Union or something. Uh, so last question, because I, I, I know um, people who deal with history and certainly conservatives don't, you, you, you don't get them to easily make prophecies. But at that point, when that, that book came out, you seemed worried that, we are we, that the, the Israeli intelligentsia has it was just about to turn its back completely on on Zionism, and that is dangerous. A fear that that I shared. Um, 
do you think, what, what is your view of the future of this battle? Is, is Zionism going to prevail or is this going to gradually, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm looking for a word for corrosion. Um, is this going to be so corrosive as to, to, to tear Zionism down? Look, it, this is the same, the, we have the same problem in Israel that, that the Europeans have and that the Americans have. It's, it, it's, it's really the same fight. Um, that book that when I wrote The Jewish State, I was focusing almost entirely on Israel's history. But if you take a step back, you'll see that um, uh, the, the Oslo Accords in 1993, which set off this kind of tidal wave of, of, of post-Zionism in Israel, you know, the, the dreams of a new Middle East that we take down all of the borders in the Middle East and, uh, and, and, and uh, have you know, one, one, one big kind of regional European Union in the Middle East, that was happening in 1993, one year after the European Union was established by the Treaty of Maastricht in Europe. And um, if, 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 if you think about it, it was two years after uh, George H.W. Bush announced uh, uh, the, the New World Order uh, that was going to embrace the globe in which uh, the law of the jungle was going to be replaced by one rule of law that would, would cover the entire globe. And that was the, the beginning, that was the moment when they began talking about bringing China into the World Trade Organization, which didn't actually happen until, you know, a few years later, until 2001. But, but the, the entire Western world, not just Israel, was swamped by this utopian fantasy of a liberal world order that would include all nations in the world. And all nations were going to give up on, on, on their past and, and their, their heritage and their culture and their borders. So it, it, Israel was part of that tidal wave. And uh, we don't know how that story is going to end. We don't know how it's going to end in Israel. And we don't know how it's going to end in America or Europe. Israel is in better shape than most other countries. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, the Israelis are closer to their uh, national and religious traditions. And I'm talking about almost all Israelis. Including um, secular are, Israelis. In, 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 including almost everyone. I mean, the, the, there's a very small uh, in, in, in intellectual uh, leftist elite, which is, you know, maybe 5% of the, of the voting population you know, maybe it's slightly more, but I don't think so. I, I, I think it's roughly that, who really believe that Israel should abandon its Zionist and Jewish mission and, uh, and, and become, you know, like a John Lennon state, a liberal state. Most Israelis are not there, but, the, uh, but this elite is extremely powerful. It, it controls uh, not, not just the universities, uh, but, uh, but the schools, the media, uh, the courts the and yeah. the, the, the judiciary. It, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's really kind of frightening to watch the, uh, the Israeli Supreme court, um, uh, year after year advance these, these same liberal post Zionist, uh, ideas and, and where, where the goal is to make it illegitimate for Israel to be a Jewish state and, uh, very frightening, very, very difficult to see how it's, all going to end. Um, I, I, I plan to end on a happy note, but I, 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 can't, <laughs> resist, I, I can't resist mentioning um, that um, there was a, 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 there was a free immigration contingent in, in the Israeli intelligentsia, and I witnessed that. I, I protested against this in a counter uh, protest. I was standing with uh, on the other side of the road, and they they finished their demonstration singing not a tikva but imagine, and th this was a, a founding <laughs> moment. That this is what they felt they had to sing in the end, and it's, it used to be. I, I come from peace now, you know. I've shifted from the the left to the right, but peace now demonstrations uniformly ended with a tikva. Always, we were patriarchs, and this may no longer be the case. Yoram Chazoni, let's call this part one of a conversation. I would love to, to okay. talk to you again. Thank you very sure. much for your time. My, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Gadi. Thank you. Thank you very much.